All right, so I think we shall get started now. So Tenaka Kato no Mai Harimai, Executive Officer of Cancer Foundation, Takaro, Taku Tuaranga Mahi, Ko Leon Willis, Taku Inua. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Liam Willis. I am the Executive Officer of the Gut Cancer Foundation. and I am delighted to welcome you all here today for this webinar exploring the role of nutrition in cancer prevention. Just before we do get started, a wee bit of housekeeping. Um, the webinar today is being recorded. If you do have to drop off at all, then we will send you the link afterwards. You can watch it at your own leisure. Um, in terms of the format, I will take a couple of minutes to introduce the Gut Cancer Foundation and give you a bit of context around the discussion today. Then I'll introduce our special guest today, Dr. Claire Wall. Um, and Claire and I will have a, a reasonably informal discussion and Q&A around the various topics. Um, you'll note as well that you have a question and answer function. Um, please do feel free to ask any questions you like within that system. Uh, we have Sue on the call as well from the Gut Cancer Foundation, and she'll interject with anything that's relevant at the time that Claire and I are discussing it. Uh, and then furthermore, we will um, discuss those questions at the end, should we have time. So, for those of you who aren't aware, the Gut Cancer Foundation, um, we fund innovative research. Uh, we are the voice of cancers, of the digestive system. That's esophageal, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, stomach, and bowel and anal cancers as well. And then part of our mission is to provide vital information and education to improve and save the lives of New Zealanders. And that's where this particular webinar fits in to what we do. To give you a bit of an overview of gut cancers in New Zealand, collectively, we are talking about the most common form of cancers in New Zealand with over 5,700 Kiwis diagnosed uh, every single year. And overall, they actually make up 22% of all cancer diagnosis in New Zealand. So you can see it's a significant proportion of those uh, cancer registrations that take place every year. Uh, and as you can see, there's a split between those cancers of the lower gastrointestinal or digestive system, which constitute bowel cancer, uh, rectal and anal cancer, and those cancers of the upper gastrointestinal digestive system, which are pancreas, liver, stomach, esophageal, and the biliary cancers and gallbladder as well. Survival rates, unfortunately, for this group of cancers are particularly poor. They're amongst the lowest um, in New Zealand, and you can see that of those listed in this report from uh, the Cancer Control Agency, Tehahu, um, of those listed with under 30% of survival rates in, in New Zealand, five of them there are, are actually cancers of the digestive system. So not only are these cancers very prevalent, they're also particularly poor outcomes. So this is a quote that I think is very relevant to today from Chris Wilde, Director of International Agency for Research on Cancer. No country can afford to treat their way out of a cancer crisis. And this is relevant because what we're talking about here is cancer prevention um, and how we go about reducing our risks. And just an overview of that, the World Cancer Research um, Fund, the American Cancer, in, at the American Institute for Cancer Research, produced a report which was um, delivered in New Zealand by Te Ahu o Te Kahu, um, in their state of the cancer uh, in New Zealand uh, report, which stated that around 30 to 50% of all cancers are actually preventable, and that the can cancer prevention recommended recommendations in general include those listed here, such as smoking, uh, being physically active, but you can see the ones highlighted are, are intrinsically linked to nutrition. So there are very uh, variables here that, 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 that can reduce our risk and um, that are very linked to today's topic. And uh, that, that report also pointed out, as you can see, that these are the cancers that are actually, uh, uh, that are affected and, and the, the risks are increased. Um, by uh, increased body weight, which of course is linked to nutrition and, and all of the cancers of the digestive system are linked within the, to that um, nutritional aspect. So the purpose of today's webinar is to take a deeper dive into the research and the science behind the idea that what we put in our bodies can increase or decrease the risk of developing cancers uh, of the digestive system. Now, we're very fortunate today um, to be joined by Professor Claire Wall, Dr. Claire Wall, who is a professional nutrition at the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences. Um, Claire is a long serving member of Gut Cancer Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee, which is in place to review our funding applications and give our team expert guidance on the issues relating to cancers of the digestive system. 
Claire is New Zealand's, one of New Zealand's leading experts in the relationship between nutrition and health outcomes and has extensive experience in teaching and researching the human nutrition and is an active member of the nutrition community in New Zealand. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and we shall welcome uh, Claire onto the call. Hi, Claire. Oh, kia ora tato. Um, thank you very much, um, Lynn, for the introduction and, and hello to everybody. And thanks for inviting me for this webinar today. It's a pleasure, Claire. We're very grateful to have you here with us and, and for taking the time to discuss this really important topic with us. Um, so I've, I've outlined in the instruction um, just a little bit around some of the statistics and reports uh, around cancer prevention and nutrition. But I'm very conscious that there are lots of messaging in, in the public and it's a topic um, that, that, that gets a lot of public attention. Um, but at the outset, I'm really keen to understand so what do we mean by research in, in your context and what do we mean by evidence-based practice in particular um, that, that, that generates these statistics and information for us? Yeah, that's a, a great, great question, Liam, because, you know, nutrition is such an interesting subject, isn't it? I mean, I think we're, we're all experts because we all eat, we all have a vested interest in, in food and nutrition. And there's so much information out there about food and nutrition. And probably I've, I reflect back on my own career and think about how technology has really changed access for people in terms of um, information, or, you know, all levels, but particularly around nutrition. Um, and so there's so much information and it's really hard to kind of unpack, you know, what is evidence based or, or what is information versus what is misinformation. And I think that's really difficult for everybody, particularly when there are, you know, um, we all have a kind of biased belief and uh, around nutrition, as I say, because we all eat. And and that's kind of because, you know, we have been brought up with certain um, thoughts and feelings about the foods that we eat and the relationship with those foods with how we feel. And so we all have a, you know, a kind of already a kind of vested interest in that and a bias in it. And then when it comes to kind of health and disease, um, you know, it's very easy for us to just Google or look up information on the internet about, um, you know, the relationship between food and diet and nutrition. But also, you know, follow people who are very influential, like on Instagram uh, and Facebook in this space as well. And so when we're starting to kind of think about, you know, what is evidence based information, what information, you know, is correct um, that's really difficult because sometimes some of that information that's on the internet as well um, is produced by people who've got all sorts of very fancy sounding credentials um, as well as those that you know haven't got so many fancy sounding credentials so often that can be really difficult as well so what we mean by uh, evidence based for example the information that you just showed from the um, cancer control agency which is really information that has got from the World Cancer Fund um, is really information that we feel if we had to stand up in court and say, Your Honour, <laughs> we know that this food is going to help protect us against cancer and we have all the evidence and here is the evidence, then it's kind of that level of evidence. So, you know, we often see attention grabbing headlines in the newspaper or on the internet, you know, for example, uh, you know, dark chocolate cures bowel cancer or heart disease, eating, you know, dark chocolate every day or drinking a glass of red wine every day is beneficial for our health. But, you know, where does that information come from? Is it based on somebody's own personal experience, what we call anecdotal evidence? Is it based on a very small study that was done on 30 or 40 people and the newspaper has thought, this is an exciting headline, so I'm going to take this research this paper that's been published and I'm going to write about it in a newspaper article and before you know it, it's around the world and everybody thinks drinking red wine is really good for them or eating you know dark cho chocolate is really good for them but when we as nutrition um, academics or nutrition researchers when we look at evidence we want to know you know how was that study conducted with drinking the red wine or eating the red or eating the uh, dark chocolate? How was the study conducted? How many people were in the study? How old were they? Has this study been repeated elsewhere? Have other studies found the same outcomes? 
have they found it in different population groups, different cultural groups? So we want to really understand and know that this is really true. This outcome, this finding is really, really true. And so when you read a report from the Cancer Control Agency or the World Cancer Fund, and they're saying, you know, that there is a relationship between the types of diets or our, our body weight and the risk of getting certain types of cancers, you know that they've really done their due diligence. They've gone out, they've looked at all the research around the world and they've decided, they've graded it. They've decided whether it really does stand up in court, it gets a grade A or it's kind of a bit iffy. You know, there just isn't enough information. The, the outcome hasn't been seen in enough people. It hasn't been repeated enough times to really say 100% that they're really sure that eating a certain type of diet is beneficial or risky for getting cancer. The other really difficult thing with cancer too and getting the evidence is that cancer tends to occur over a reasonably long period of time. What I mean by that is, it's exposure to a certain type of environment or eating a certain type of diet over a relatively long period of time, particularly when we're thinking about gut cancers. And so it's really quite hard thinking about how we get information about people's dietary intake over a very long period of time, you know, from when they were a baby all the way through their life to when they actually get cancer and then relating what they've eaten over that lifetime to their risk of getting cancer. So the kind of studies that we need to really be able to look at nutrition and the risk of cancer are kind of really long-term studies as well as being done in many populations. And so that is also really quite difficult because how do we keep people in studies for long periods of time? Where do we get the money to do that? And also it's quite difficult asking people about what they eat. <laughs> It's quite a nosy, uh, invasive thing. And people often don't like telling you what they eat. They feel, yeah, it's quite invasive and um, yeah, threatening. So there's quite a lot of um, difficulties in getting enough evidence to stand up in court to say, absolutely, these are the kinds of foods that if you eat this, these sorts of foods or this type of dietary pattern, it's going to protect you from getting cancer. Really interesting, Claire. Thank you. Uh, it shows the, the uh, as you say, the complexity around getting uh, actual data and, and uh, evidence-based research in this area. So am I right to uh, assume then that um, some of these studies are retrospective? So we're asking people what their habits were once yeah. they've had a cancer diagnosis and that's how we gain that data? Yes. So it's a really good question. When we think about the hierarchy of evidence, because we need to look at the exposures to certain diet, types of diets and foods over a period of time to say whether there's any risk of developing cancer. The kind of studies that we look at are either what we call longitudinal studies. So sort of studies that have followed up large populations for long periods of time. So for example, in New Zealand, we've got the Dunedin longitudinal study. I think people in that study are in their kind of mid sixties now. And then we also have the more contemporary cohort longitudinal study, which is growing up in New Zealand, where they recruited about seven and a half thousand women when they were 28 weeks pregnant. And they're now following up the children of those women at 12 years of age. So, you know, that's already kind of, a, you know, two longitudinal studies um, in New Zealand. So there are those types of studies. And then you follow up those people and at various time points, you kind of ask them, all sorts of questions about their health, but also questions about their dietary intake and their dietary habits. So there are that, that sort of evidence. Or there is evidence where when people are diagnosed with a cancer, you can ask them what you were saying retrospectively. So you can ask them what their diets were like, or you know, in terms of what their usual dietary habits are. But the problem with that is that it's retrospective. So sometimes when somebody's diagnosed with a specific condition, it's quite hard for them to um, remember everything that they've eaten over, you know, or their normal dietary patterns over a, a period of time. Or they may not want to tell you certain types of foods that they eat with the risk of feeling uncomfortable that they may have caused their own cancer. So retrospective you know we do rely on it a bit for evidence but it can be difficult we also use something called case control studies 
where we would match somebody who was diagnosed with a certain gastric cancer to somebody of a very similar age, same gender, same socio-demographic status, who doesn't have cancer. And we have a group of people with the cancer, group of people without. And then we also then look at their types of lifestyle behaviors and their dietary intake and exposures as well, retrospectively. So there's also that line of evidence. The ultimate evidence, the top of the pyramid evidence that really does stand up in court is the randomized control trial. And so that's where you randomize people to either receiving a certain type of diet and uh, randomize a group of people to a placebo, which is really hard because with whole diet, you know, what is a placebo? If you just want to look at a vitamin, that's easy because you can put, give somebody, you know, one group of people vitamin C in a capsule, and then you can give another group of people who are the control, the like same capsule, but with no vitamin C in it. And so for single nutrients, it's easy to do a randomized control trial and then look at their outcomes. But for whole diet, it's really difficult. And also, if you're really going to do a randomized control trial to look at cancer risk, those people would have to stay in the trial for a long period of time, long, long period of time. So most people don't have that kind of money either to do studies like that. So, yeah, it, nutrition is complex and therefore it is very hard to come up with absolutely concrete evidence. And that's why we're very careful about the sorts of evidence that we produce and that these sorts of reports produce as well. And they, they, the World Cancer Fund, if anybody goes onto their website, is fascinating because they have this thing called the um, Continuum Project, where they are just constantly just getting research from around the world and updating their databases and just, you know, constantly informing um, the evidence around lifestyle and, ca and cancer prevention. It's really interesting and really useful. And something I was going to ask you, given the difficulty that you've just explained around um, getting this, this evidence in the research, where is it that we should be looking? So you've mentioned the World Cancer Fund, and obviously we had the report from the Cancer Control Agency that I believe took information from the World Cancer Fund um, uh, data yeah. and, and statistics. But is there, is there any, anywhere else that we can go to to, to look at um, the evidence-based research that we're discussing here? Yeah, so I think credible sources would be, yes, like the World Cancer Fund, the Cancer Control Agency, so government organisations or non-government organised uh, government organizations like the Cancer Society, for example, in different country, obviously our own New Zealand, but also in different countries. Um, so I think anything that's related to a government organization or an NGO um, or a foundation that is got is not funded, um, you know, by interested parties to be careful what I say there, but, you know, that isn't conflicted. So it's not funded by, you know, Coca-Cola or um, so, you know, foundations um, are quite useful as well. But yeah, you can't really go wrong with um, NGOs, government organisations or organisations that are set up as a collaborations between different associations and organisations who um, specialise in cancer. Really helpful thank you Claire and of course you know one of the roles that we try and perform here at the Gut Cancer Foundation is to try and ensure that the information that we're providing and one of the reasons for this webinar is is that it is authoritative and, and, and research-based and evidence-based so that, that the stuff that we produce will be um, hopefully along those lines as well so look I think you've given us a really good context about what we're talking about in terms of the, the type of research and type of evidence that we need to have some clarity around this but if we move on to talk a little bit more around the specifics now of, of what we could should and be doing um, based on that research are there any guidelines globally or, or New Zealand based around nutrition diet and the impact on on cancer prevention and, and cancer of the, of the digestive system in particular mm. I think you highlighted them from the cancer control um, agency report and they're obviously based also on the World Cancer um, Research Fund report as well and they really are around um poor nutrition. And so when we define poor nutrition, we mean um, diets that um, don't 
provide us with adequate nutrition, but also unhealthy body weight. So, and also alcohol intake. So I think they were some of the key things that were highlighted in that report. And most of their evidence, as I say, they get from both New Zealand evidence, so it's contextualized, but also from the World Cancer um, Research Fund as well. Um, so they're, they're the key things. And within, when you go further into the report and you look at what they mean by poor nutrition, they're really talking about diets which are low in whole foods, so low in fruits and vegetables, low in whole grains, and foods that are and, and diets that are characterized by high intakes of red meat, processed meats, and ultra processed foods and salty foods. Um, and then diets that are high in kind of more of the what we call energy dense foods, nutrient poor foods that encourage kind of an unhealthy weight. So they're, they're the kind of key, I suppose, in terms of the top evidence around food and nutrition uh, and cancer prevention. They're the key messages. Great, thank you. So uh, can we just have a little exploration, I guess, around the evidence-based advice that there is around eating? Uh, you're talking there about eating whole foods uh, yes. versus processed foods. And that's then, I guess, in contrast to a specific diet of some description, you know, that, that says this will be a cancer prevention diet. We're talking far more generally. Can you go into a yeah. little bit more detail around the, 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 the good that whole foods can do for us and the, the benefits that fresh fruit, fresh vegetables and, and, and grains actually have on, on us and how they, they do have a, a preventative measure for cancer as well yes so again sort of going back to the evidence I suppose the evidence has really come around looking at populations that eat high amounts of fruits and vegetables that have a lower risk of uh, cancers particularly gut cancers and a lot of that evidence has also been backed up by um, other studies that have been done in the laboratory so looking at cells and looking at some of the components in fruits and vegetables and how they do protect us from getting um, cancer and a, a, a lot of the evidence appears that by eating more fruits and vegetables um, in your diet, you have an abundance of nutrients and nutrients um, which are also quite powerful antioxidants. And those antioxidant nutrients are vitamin C, which everyone will be familiar with, and also beta carotene. And antioxidant nutrients are really good at making sure that our cells stay healthy and stay intact. So as our cells are kind of reproducing in our body, and that's happening the whole time, you know, cells die off, we get rid of them, and then we have to reproduce new cells. The DNA, so the kind of um, fabric, if you like, of the cell needs to stay, keep its integrity. And the antioxidant vitamins really help those cells keep their integrity and stop them from going rogue or mutating to become cancer cells. So they're really powerful at doing that. Now, it's not just the vitamins, but it's also the um, other what we call non-nutrients in fruit and vegetables that also have very powerful antioxidant effects as well. So when we look at fruits and vegetables and often people talk about, you know, eating from the color, you know, the colors of the rainbow, trying to eat as many colors as you can. The reason for that is that there's these substances in fruit and vegetables called polyphenols and there are lots of different types of polyphenols. And, and, and other types of components like them as well. And they give the color to the fruits and vegetables and they themselves are really powerful um, antioxidants. So we know that by eating fruits and vegetables, not only do you get you know, lots of nutrients, but you get these powerful antioxidant nutrients and non-nutrients. And then the other thing that fruit and vegetables provide is that they're quite high in water. So we know that people that have high intakes of fruits and vegetables, their consumption in terms of weight of food intake in a day is quite high. So they fill up on fruits and vegetables rather than filling up on some foods which are more energy dense, but and not, you know, not have as much weight in them. And so they get fuller uh, and therefore they're likely to eat less. So we know that people that have very high amounts of fruits and veg in their diet tend to eat uh, less calories, less energy overall. So they serve, you know, yeah, a, a, a great overall in terms of being cancer um, preventive, preventative. Um, that yeah, they're probably one of the most important aspects of our diet that we should pay attention to. 
it's absolutely fascinating Claire. thank you really um yeah oh i was going to mention too i could go on forever about vegetables <laughs> fruit vegetables yeah, no, please do, um, please do yeah. green leafy vegetables in particular contain a quite high sources of a another a b vitamin which is really important also for keeping our cells healthy which is um, something called folate so many of you are probably familiar with that as well Brilliant. Thank you. Some really, really helpful information. And as we're on kind of um, the different food groups and, and the benefits that they have, we know that um, fibre can play a role um, and diets high in fibre can play a role in reducing the risk, particularly, I think, of colorectal cancer, um, bowel cancer. So are you able just to elaborate a little bit more on that side of things for us yeah, as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. So dietary fibre is also found as another you know, important, a good segue from fruits and vegetables because fruits and vegetables are also a good source of dietary fibre. So dietary fibre is the part of the plant that we actually can't digest. So when we consume, you know, fruit and vegetables or uh, plant-based material, particularly whole grain material, um, like, you know, whole meal, um, whole, whole meal uh, bread or brown rice or brown, or brown pasta, so whole grain foods, there's part of that of the grain that we actually can't digest and absorb into our body. And that actually passes through our digestive system into our large bowel. The great thing about that, that fiber, fibrous substance, is that it helps our digestive system to keep us regular. So it helps food to move through our digestive system well. It stops us from getting constipated. Um, and that's really important in terms of digestive health because we don't want stuff sitting around in our gut for a long period of time because that can also impact on the cell lining within our gut as well. And if we've got some substances in there which, um, you know, uh, could could be detrimental to those cells, it helps bind that up, it helps mop it up and helps it move through the through the bowel quite quickly. And there are different types of fibres. So there's soluble fibre, which we kind of you know acts like a sponge so it takes up water and expands and that's what can kind of help our stools um say stay nice and soft and not get con you know get constipation and then there's insoluble fiber which is a sort of tougher um uh plant fiber which doesn't take up water but is really important in terms of providing food for those bacteria that live in our large bowel and what those bacteria do, and I know that you are going to have a webinar um, quite soon, um, uh, looking more at the microbiome and microbiota. But what that bacteria in our large bowel is really important for is the eating this fibre and producing something called short chain fatty acids. And that's a product of their own digestion of dietary fibre. And those short chain fatty acids, those little chemicals, really help the cells in the large bowel and within the cell wall stay healthy so it feeds them and it keeps them healthy and it decreases of the risk of those coming cancer cells so so fiber's got eating dietary fiber's got quite a lot of um, really important aspects in terms of gut health helping food move through the bowel which is really important so keeping it healthy but also feeding the bacteria in the large bowel and keeping those cells in the large bowel healthy. Really fascinating. Thank you, Claire. And I think it's really good to be able to focus on, on the positive things that we can do. I think we hear a lot about um, what we shouldn't be doing and what yes. we should out. Um, so it's great to hear um, of the actual what happens when we are putting these uh, whole foods and fruit and vegetables in our body and the impact that we can have. That being said, we do know that there are some food groups and some um, mm. uh, pieces of advice out there. Um, and we touched on it before around uh, excessive processed meat um, intake and, and high salt preserved foods. Uh, so are you able to talk us through a little bit around, again, in a similar way, the impact that, that consuming um, large quantities of these foods has? And I think as well just contextualize it because i think you know we're all human we all live in a world where we have a, a, a varied diet um and i don't think it's it's the case that we're suggesting everybody should cut everything out all the time so um can we understand a bit more about what the impact of, 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 of the intake of these foods is and the i guess some comment on the, the varying impact 
of, of small quantity versus mm. excessive and, and prolonged exposure to these food groups. Absolutely. I think you raise a really good point there, Lim, because we don't just eat for health. Let's face it. Most of us eat because we enjoy eating. Um, you know, we enjoy this, this, the social side of eating. Um, we enjoy food because it tastes good. It makes us feel good. We have what we call uh, humans. We have this kind of hedonistic pleasure zone in our head. And that we get a great response from eating foods that provide us with pleasure. And often those foods that provide us with pleasure are high in, in fat and high in sugar. And, you know, they're the, the, the chocolate, the cakes, the chippies, those sorts of things. So, you know, they're, they're, they're delicious. They're the, all the foods that, you know, we, we like to eat. And I think, and I agree with you that um, we shouldn't be saying that people should, you know, just live on fruit and veg and whole grains um we've got to also think about the culture of eating and what it means to us socially um you know the mental health aspect of being eat, being able to eat together going out for meals celebrating people with food that is so so important um so i think yeah we have to be really really mindful of having messaging which promotes you know certain foods for health and also asking people to you know remind them to limit certain foods that aren't so healthy but in the context of that it's the whole diet you know it's not just picking out certain foods so I'm, I'm a great sort of believer in the kind of bit of the 80 20 rule that you know if 80 percent of the time you're you know you're on the right track in your lifestyle behaviors and then 20 percent of the time you know they're maybe not so good then that's that's still pretty good I don't think we can be, you know, perfect 100% of the time, whatever that even means. Um, so in terms of the foods that you highlighted, again, from the Cancer Control Agency, which we've known, which we also know increase our risk of cancer. These really are what I sort of lump together as what sort of ultra processed foods. And that's quite a difficult definition because every time you do something with a food, you know, you cut it up, you know, an apple or you, you, you cook an egg, that's kind of processing the food, isn't it? But when you move a food so far away from its original form or a food that isn't doesn't even resemble a whole food, that's kind of what we call ultra processed foods. So foods, you know, like a lot of snack foods, ready made meals, um, you know, sugar sweetened beverages. So some of those really highly, highly processed foods where the food has been kind of really processed and developed beyond its original, what it looked like in its whole form, or it's had a lot of added ingredients to it. So it's had a lot of added, particularly sugar, a lot of added salt, a lot of preservatives and other things added to it. Now, often these foods taste good um, because they're high in salt and sugar and often fat as well, and they taste good. And um, they're very accessible, um, they're cheap, uh, and so they do actually contribute in New Zealand to a very large part of people's diets. The other thing with those foods as well is that they're very high in energy. They're high in energy, but they're low volume. So, you know, I always give the example of a kind of typical classic breakfast where you, you know, that I would have been brought up in England. My mother would have made me, which was like scrambled eggs on wholemeal toast with a bit of fruit salad on the side versus you know eating that versus eating two donuts well they're probably about the same calories those two breakfasts but eating the you know the scrambled egg the wholemeal bread and the fruit salad it's quite a lot to eat it would take you quite a long time to eat it and digest it compared to eating two small donuts which would be the same equivalent energy so it's very easy to overeat ultra processed foods. So we tend to gain more weight. We tend to people eat more ultra processed foods and their diets tend to be more likely to be of a um, unhealthy weight. And we know that weight is very much related or healthy weight is very much related to cancer risk. And then there are certain aspects of ultra processed foods, particularly for stomach cancer, consuming foods that are quite high in salt, particularly um, lots of pickled foods and a lot of processed meats as well. So that's like your bacon and sausages and salami um, is an increased risk, particularly for gastric, um, for stomach cancers. 
So I sort of, even though we can pick out sort of certain types of foods and the risk with certain types of cancers, they still end up being in the same basket, what I call kind of highly processed or ultra processed foods. And so the idea is that we limit those in our diet, you know, so if we're used to having those every day in some form, form or another, then let's start thinking about having them every other day instead of every day. Or if, you know, we're used to eating, um, you know, lots of takeaways um, every night and maybe try, let's try and move towards limiting that to, you know, two or three times a week. So it's, it's how often, <clears throat> how often you do that and how much of it, it is within your dietary pattern. And I think instead of picking out single items or single food, sometimes I like to think about nutrition and food in a more holistic way. It's kind of our dietary patterns. And there are lots of different types of dietary patterns that can be healthy and they're very much individual for you. But if we have a dietary pattern that really emphasizes more fruits and veggies, whole grains, and limits some of these ultra processed foods, then that's kind of a healthier, a healthier dietary pattern. And really, really helpful. Thank you, Claire. It's incredibly insightful. Thank you. And, and uh, do you, is there anything, you know, as you talked about with the, the, the physiology of the fiber and what it does inside our guts and, and, and similarly with the, with the fresh fruit and vegetables, is there anything that you can talk to around what's happening when we do eat these processed foods within our gut and how it may, uh, there may be a bit of a cycle going on as well, where we're feeding back the, the bad microbiome that's there and then there's cravings yes. for that as well that, 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 yeah. that need breaking. So, you know, that that's why we once the more we eat of that type of food the more we we do crave it is that is that a right assumption to make yeah i think it's hard to know whether sugar i know there is quite a lot of research around sugar being addictive and it's hard to know whether it's addictive like smoking or or alcohol is but there is no doubt that as a pleasure as a food that provides us with that hedonistic as i say that response within our brain and um, certainly those foods that are high in fat, high in salt and high in sugar do provide us with that pleasure. And maybe that, you know, that repeated exposure means that you're much more likely to want to eat those types of foods. Now, whether that's an addiction, I don't know. I'm not an expert in that area. But a dietary pattern that you're used to having that very highly flavoured food, very salted food, sweet foods. It's quite difficult then to go to a food, sorry, dietary pattern that doesn't have those those types of foods in it you know eating just fruits and veggies and more whole foods could could be quite bland for some people after they've had a dietary pattern that emphasizes more of the ultra processed foods so you know the beha food behavior is quite complex and whether it's addiction or behavior or just also limited access you know some people food is expensive and some people have limited access to whole foods and healthy foods and they have much greater access to ultra processed foods and, and yeah, and, un, and unhealthy foods. Coming back to your question, though, sorry, I got off topic there about some of the more mechanistic things. I think the, the salt's quite interesting. You know, why does why would eating more, you know, diets high in salt cause gastric cancer, for example? So quite a lot of research on this area and particularly that the types of salty foods and it appears that a lot of the data the evidence comes more from asia asian countries and asian cultures um, and it's more around um, processed meats and also pickles so eating a lot of pickle type foods as well that have used a lot of salt you know in terms of the brining and pickling um, but just having diets that are high in salt in general isn't good for our overall health um, and with the gastric cancers, the mechanistic side of things, what they think is having these very highly salted foods can cause some kind of lesions within the cell, within the mucosal lining, so in the cells that line the stomach wall. And these lesions kind of can damage the cells and these the cells are at higher risk then of becoming cancerous cells. So that's the kind of evidence, the mechanistic evidence for that as well. Great, thank you, Claire. That's really, really helpful. And just to touch um, briefly on alcohol as well, um, and the the impact that that may have on. Uh, we all know that that excessive, prolonged exposure to alcohol is, is not not good for us. It's not healthy. But in terms of 
um, uh, increasing risks of cancers, what's going on uh, with our bodies then with the, the prolonged exposure to alcohol? Yeah, so prolonged exposure to alcohol, again, it can affect the gut lining and so it can damage the cells in the gut lining. It also impacts on our liver and our ability for our liver to make bile and bile is really important because it gets excreted from our liver into our gallbladder and goes down our gall uh, bile duct into our small intestine it's really important for breaking down fat um, and so when again when those sorts of processes start to become affected so obviously alcohol really can impact on our liver and our function of our liver that can also impact what's going on within our gut as well and so it can expose the gut to other types of chemicals which aren't so good for it and can cause again damage to the cells in the lining of the of the of the GI tract. Often also people who consume high intakes of alcohol as well, there is an association with poor dietary quality. So we know that people that consume more alcohol tend to have poorer quality diets and therefore they're less likely also to be eating, you know, enough. Uh, enough food to provide them with all the vitamins and minerals that they require, the fruits and veggies, etc. So often the alcohol displaces the healthy food that you know within their diet too. Thank you. That's that's again that's really helpful, Claire. Um, just wanted to see if we could touch on any novel studies or new information that's out there, um, any research that you're aware of globally that is driving new practice and, and new recommendations in this field. Mm. Just got, sort of going back a bit, which kind of ties into this a little bit about the unhealthy weight, you know, um, kind of again the mechanism around that. And that's probably also where quite a lot of the research is going as well in terms of trying to support people even post diagnosis with trying to you know lose weight which seems to kind of uh, be at odds sometimes with some of the treatment that is given for cancer but um there's quite a lot of interest in trying to understand what it is about being an unhealthy weight that it puts people at risk of can getting cancer so there is you know a couple of mechanistic things so one is that being of an unhealthy weight often means not always that you might have a higher percentage of body fat that is that is healthy and that higher percentage of body fat can drive um, inflammation and it's the inflammatory processes metabolic processes within the body that can increase our risk for cancer so it can promote sort of genome instability and mutations within cells and so there's quite a lot of interest I suppose to trying to understand more about that inflammatory process because what we also know is that you can be of an unhealthy weight but you can still be healthy so it's not you know we tend to use BMI as this kind of cut off and you know where a, a healthy weight should be within a certain BMI range and an unhealthy weight above and and below but actually that's not really telling us what's going on inside our bodies you know so we often talk about you know athletes who have high BMIs because they've got a lot of muscle on board and but yet on the BMI scale they would be overweight or obese but yet we know that they're not unhealthy they're not so there's quite a lot of interest in trying to understand more about the relationship between body weight the body composition so how much fat how much lean body mass we, mass we have and cancer risk but also body weight and cancer treatment. So that's quite a big area of research as well. Um, and some of the other um, research areas I sort of touched on a little bit before when we talked about cancer exposure and how we measure, you know, the evidence for cancer to certain types of diets over periods of time. Um, it's really that whole idea about how we can impact life very early on in life like in utero so during pregnancy during the first few years of life and what the environment that our children you know grow up in and the sorts of foods and diets that they eat and how that in the early phases of their life could put them at risk of getting cancer later on in life so there's quite a lot of um, research in that that kind of early life area as well and then obviously the very topical um, research area in diet nutrition is the microbiota and the microbiome. 
So and, and particularly around cancer and 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 other other diseases as well. Sure, uh, and that is an area that we want to explore a little bit more. I think you alluded to it before. We were in the process of arranging a webinar with um, uh, Rachel Purcell, that's Rachel Purcell, who is uh, expert in microbiome, uh, and we has received funding from Gut Cancer Foundation in the past actually to do some research in that area. So that will be the next in our series of webinars in uh, around. Um, the health of our gut and, and the health of uh, how we can help prevent um, gut cancers from 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 emerging. Um, look, I know that you have a couple of slides prepared, Claire, to give a little bit of an overview and just uh, uh, round off what we'll be discussing. I think probably now is a good time to jump onto those, if that's okay with you. And I'll just say to everybody else as well, if you do have any questions, please use the Q and A uh, box to pop them in there. Um, Sue and I can see them come through, and and we'll um, we'll uh, we'll ask um, Dr. Wall about any questions you have once the uh, presentation section has been finished. So just over to you to share your screen. But... Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Is it? Um... So yeah, just to reiterate, I suppose what we're talking about before. Um, there is, yeah, where, where do we get the evidence from? Where does this evidence come from around diet and, and cancer? And is the stuff that you read on the internet or Instagram, you know, how credible is it? And should we be listening to it? <clears throat> and gosh, there is so much evidence. It's really, is really quite, <clears throat> excuse me, really quite confusing. And one of the reasons for that is it's really quite hard to study cancer diet and nutrition because, as I said before, take a long time to occur so therefore looking at exposure over time and um, the sorts of diets and nutrition that can cause cancer you know we need to be able to um, look at that over time and often there are only certain types of studies that can do that um, and also you know the fact that it's not just excessive intakes of foods it's also can be insufficient intake of certain foods as well and it's difficult to act accurately measure food intake so that is you know in terms of trying to get the evidence it is really quite difficult as I said if we had to stand up in court we have to be really careful about you know what evidence we use and so this is what you know, I kind of tried to explain about the hierarchy of evidence we use this kind of pyramid where <clears throat> you know a lot of the evidence around nutrition on the internet or that people talk about is very much anecdotal it's based on small studies or how just generally people feel about food and nutrition. If they've been on a certain diet uh, or taken certain types of dietary supplements um, and it's made them feel good, then that's what we call anecdotal evidence. Or they've had a friend whose you know, cancer was cured by um, eating dark chocolate. Then that's kind of you know, anecdotal evidence. The next level of evidence that we go to that I kind of talked about in the beginning is really those observational studies. So we look at the association over time with what people eat and their health outcomes. And so a lot of nutrition studies are really observational studies. The top, the highest quality of evidence that we can possibly have is randomized control trials. And they're quite difficult to do with whole diet and quite difficult to do in cancer because you'd have to put people on a con randomized controlled trial for quite a long period of time to really understand um, you know, the outcome um, for um, cancer risk. So that's why it is quite difficult to study cancer, um, nutrition and cancer and get the evidence that's required. And that's why um, always going for best evidence and going to these types of reports is really important to, to get your evidence. So the first line of evidence that we talked about from the report was really around healthy weight. And so we know that actually unhealthy weight is a risk for all uh, gastric cancers, all of them. So um, we know that being a healthy weight is, put, you know, reduce or, or can prevent us from getting any type of cancer, but particularly um, gastric cancers. So trying to stay of a healthy weight requires us to be on a healthy diet that's suitable for us. Um, physical activity can really help also with maintaining a healthy weight, getting good sleep. Sleep hygiene is also really helpful in obtaining a healthy weight and reducing our stress. And just really commenting on BMI is useful, 
but you can have a high BMI and still be healthy. It just depends on what your body composition is like. So we know with cancer, the risk of unhealthy weight is far greater if you've got a higher percentage of body fat. In terms of um, the summary of about diet and the evidence for diet, so the association between diet and risk of cancer, we know that there is an increased risk if we have a re reduction in whole grains, non-starchy fruits and vegetables, dietary fiber, low-fat dairy products. And these eating these can also or can reduce the risk of these these types of cancers. So if we look at think about the gastric cancers, so bowel cancer oral cavity cancer, cancers um, and liver cancer. When we think about um, limiting the foods that we talked about, the other um, associated risk is consuming foods that, are, uh, sorry, ultra processed foods that are high intakes of red meat, fruit, foods that are preserved by salting and grilled or barbecued meat or fish can also risk, increase the risk of these types of cancers. So bowel, stomach, oral, uh, which are obviously related to gastric cancers. And I didn't actually talk about grilling and barbecuing um, when we, Liam and I um, talked, but the grilling and barbecuing part of um, increasing people's cancer risk is that if you heat uh, meat in particular to a very high temperature, as we often do on the barbecue and get that really nice blackened kind of look and taste, it can increase something called heterocyclic amines or polycyclic amines on the outside of the meat. Um, and that is a carcinogen. So consuming that too often can increase our risk of particularly bowel cancer. So I just thought just to be a little bit practical here. Um, but what do we mean by increase in fruit and veggie intake? What does that mean and, and how much? So the evidence suggests that we should be eating about 400 grams a day. And each of these items here are 100 grams. Now we think about what New Zealand, the average New Zealander consumes. So about around one third of adults get the recommended five servings of, of vegetables and fruit each day. So that's only a third. And less than half of all children get the recommended five servings of vegetables and fruit each day. So 400 grams is more than five, actually a bit more than five servings. So it's actually quite a lot of fruit and veggie to consume. So half a cup or a fist sized portion of cooked vegetables is 100 grams. A cup of raw chopped vegetables is 100 grams. Two cups of raw salad leaves is 100 grams. A medium apple orange pear is 100 grams. Two, two small fruits like plums or mandarins, apricots, 100 grams, etc. So it is, it is quite a lot. And when we consider that most New Zealanders, well, only a third of New Zealanders actually even consume five servings of fruits and veggie day. It is, it is quite a big uh, ask for people to increase their amount of fruit and veg to that. So how can we increase our fruit and veggies in our diet? Stir fries are great. They're quick. You can use lots of veggies in them. Um, you can keep a bowl of veggies like celery, carrots, radishes, broccoli, cut up and ready for snacking. Um, you can serve with a dip as a healthy snack. You can save leftover veggies during the week and put them in the freezer and have veggie soups on Fridays or at the weekends. Try and add a kind of lettuce and tomatoes to your to your sandwich. I know I'm always in a rush in the morning and I make my peanut butter sandwich and I think, no, I must put must put some salad in there as well. Um, mix finely grated carrots with peanut butter and use a spread for crackers. Add vegetables to cream cheese or ricotta cheese and blend to make into spreads, etc. And just a little reminder there, that bowl of frozen veggies. Obviously, fruit and vegetables are really expensive, particularly at this time of year. They're cheaper if you buy in season. They don't have, you don't have to buy exotic um, vegetables, so just buy in season. But frozen vegetables are just as, just, just as good as fresh and in some cases can be better. So they're really useful to add to, um, you know, to stir fries or to soups or casseroles. Um, or to just, you know, have on the side um, with your dinner. So it's the same actually also with um, tinned uh, fruit. So as long as it's not tinned in, uh, you know, lots of sugar or syrup and it's just tinned in water, then tinned fruit as again and tinned vegetables can also be really useful additions as well if you're trying to increase your fruit and veg. Um, increasing beans, pulses and legumes. So this again um, is part of the, uh, you know, 
in terms of the report, in terms of increasing our dietary fibre intake, it's really useful to start consuming more beans, pulses and legumes, particularly in place of meat. So if you're a big, you know, meat eater, try to swap out some of your meat and, you know, add into stews and casseroles, beans, pulses and legumes are really useful pureeing beans as a basis for dips and spreads and again you can use tinned they're really you know they've been um cooked so you're going to take the cooking and preparation out of them but just make sure that they're they're tinned in water rather than brine you can add chickpeas or black beans to salads um if you buy you know a salad at work and there are no beans or anything available maybe you can take a kind of small container with them in and throw them onto your salad at work um, you can add cooked beans to meatballs or burgers. I always think the classic meal for me is, which I had actually last night, which is chili waste. So you can reduce your amount of red meat, your, your mince within the chili. And, you know, you can add a can of kidney beans. And snack on a handful of soy nuts rather than, you know, on chips or, or crackers. In terms of whole grains, so increasing our dietary fibre, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this. So trying to eat wholemeal bread, brown rice, wholemeal pasta, using whole grains rather than refined grains, so rather than white bread and white pasta um, and white rice. So you're kind of swapping them out. The other um, um, advice is to limit our red meat. So this is to around about 500 grams a week. So if you're a you know, big red meat eater, then try and limit that and swap it out with things like chicken or fish, all the legumes and beans, as I've talked about. And also limit uh, processed meats. We talked about the fact that they contribute quite a lot of salt to our diet and they've been shown to be associated with the risk, particularly of, of gastric cancers and also um, bowel cancer. Um, but again, talking about, you know, limiting, so not cutting it out completely but just limiting so think about how much you currently eat and whether you can start to cut that down and then the other thing was limiting ultra processed foods and so this really is just a um a schematic here to kind of really try and explain to you what i mean by ultra processed foods because some people get quite confused by that terminology you know what's the difference between processed versus ultra processed so really it's the increasing level of processing and ultra processed foods are those that really don't resemble whole foods anymore. Uh, and that they've had a lot of like sugar and salt and in some cases fat added to them or into the cooking of them. So things like sugar sweetened beverages, sweet and savory packaged snacks, reconstituted meat products or highly processed meat products, pre-prepared frozen dishes, canned instant soups, chicken nuggets, ice cream, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking about whole food and whole diets, probably the best evidence we have are kind of Mediterranean and plant-based type diets being the best in terms of preventing cancer. But it doesn't mean that you have to chuck out meat or all the sorts of um, diets that you currently eat. It's just trying to kind of reshape um, our dietary patterns and trying to increase the amount of plant-based matter that we put in it. And here's just an example. So, you know, a meat-focused meal here like you know spaghetti bolognese think about reducing the amount of spaghetti bolognese on the plate and adding more vegetables to it and if in doubt always <laughs> keep calm and trust a dietitian have to have a plug for my profession in there liam fantastic claire thank you so much really thank fascinating you. insights and incredibly useful for everybody um I'm just conscious of time, but we do have a couple of questions coming through, so I would just like to try and touch on them if we can. First one's a really difficult question. Uh, it's a really pertinent one as well. It's around um, questions, what about a person who would tick all the good eating habits, exercise and body weight over her lifetime, but was still diagnosed at 68 with a stage four stomach cancer and died a year later? Is there a genetic risk that might have kicked into? And what I would say to that is that there, with with all these cancers, there are there are some that will have a genetic risk. Often, in in most of them, the, the risk is very small and it's very specific. With stomach cancer, there is a particular gene um, in some Morifano that is uh, 
uh, makes them particularly predisposed to um, diffuse stomach cancer, which is a mutation of CDH1 gene. But there are other genes more generally, such as the BRCA1, which you know more about for breast cancer, but it also has a potential impact for, for gut cancers as well. But what I would say is that the, the majority of these cancers occur randomly. And it's, sad, it's incredibly sad. There's nothing that we could do about it. There's nothing that the, the, the person involved it, it can do about it. It's I hate I hesitate to use the word bad luck because it doesn't seem pertinent enough. But it's it, it is just just incredibly unfortunate because they are random mutations of the cells. And the the, the other follow up question was: Are there other possible triggers? Um, possibly, but you know, as I say, the majority of these cancers are, are random occurrences that that one could do nothing about. And I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Claire. In particular. Yeah, I mean, all, all we're talking about here is reducing risk. There's absolutely no 100% guarantee. And, and I know that, yeah, that must be really difficult for that, you know, in, in case of that person, you know, you can do every, everything right for, you know, all your life and still get cancer. And I, I, unfortunately, the evidence around nutrition and cancer prevention is just about reducing population risk. So, it, you know, it's about shifting the bell curve, um, you know, left. So even though we know at a population level, if more people, you know, ate or, or did the recommend, recommendations around diet and nutrition, it would reduce the risk overall. But at an ind individual level, it doesn't always guarantee 100% that you're not going to get cancer. And I think it's really hard. We all know the, uh, the reverse, the opposite people that have smoked all their life, drank all their life, and, and, and don't get cancer or any type of disease. So it, it is a bit random acts of biology. I hate to say that, um, but it's it's just about reducing risk. It's not 100% guarantee that if you follow all these lifestyle um, recommendations that you'll never, ever get cancer. Thanks, Claire. Um, and then we did have one other question, which is specifically around, is there any research around olive oil at all? And I know olive oil is very heavily used in Mediterranean diets, yeah. which I've already alluded to as being the, one of the diets that, that, that have the best ways of preventing cancer. Is, is it because it because it has that association within that type of diet or is there anything right. specific yeah, around olive really oil? Really good question. I think because it is part of that whole Mediterranean diet and we know that it's really helpful in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease risk. Um, but I think there is some evidence, but it's not enough evidence to say that consuming more olive oil will, pre you know, prevent you from getting ca um, cancers or gastric cancers. But I think there is good evidence as part of that whole dietary pattern, that type of dietary pattern that choosing more of that type of oil, so monounsaturated fatty acids rather than saturated fatty acids, is definitely sort of what we call less inflammatory. So it, 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 it provides a less inflammatory state within the body. And maybe that may be associated with a reduced risk of cancer. Thank you, Claire, again, fascinating. Um, look, I think we've covered the questions that have come in today and I think you have covered an incredible breadth of, of topic here um it's been a really insightful hour I hope that everybody on the uh, webinar has enjoyed it as much as I have and um has been educated as much as uh, as I have too and just like to express my sincere thanks to you Claire for taking the time and um, to come on to this call and to give us your uh vast experience it's, it's usually appreciated and um we're very grateful to it so we'll wrap up here um do watch Thank out you. for um our, our emails coming around future webinars as well and we look forward to seeing you again in the future but for now thank you and goodbye thank you kia ora. <laughs>